when I got to San Francisco, it was about a year after the summer of love. So this was a time when you'd meet people at a bus station. Maybe you'd share a joint with them. Hmm. You know? That's trust. Yeah. I couldn't trust somebody now that offered me a joint on the street. Oh, I would never either. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to Different Leaf, the podcast, a show for new and experienced cannabis consumers. I'm Britt Smith. It's been a packed week for cannabis news, including the legalization of adult use cannabis in New York and New Mexico. We'll have more on that after today's interview. But I always think monumental weeks like this one are a great opportunity to pause and reflect on just how much has changed in cannabis law and culture since my parents and grandparents generation were kids. I admit, as a millennial, I haven't always considered what today's world of legal weed is like for the folks who were teenagers when Nixon first started the war on drugs. What it must be like for the people who, like my mom and dad, were born in the 40s, believing for most of their life that marijuana was, in fact, the devil's lettuce. And now they can go to an actual shop and pick their pot from a huge menu of carefully curated products. Today, we're going to talk to someone who has not only witnessed the vast cultural changes in the U.S. since the middle of the last century, but she has also witnessed the waves of cultural change that have happened around cannabis. Today, as those waves of change keep intensifying, she's helping other baby boomers learn to surf them the same way that she's been doing for years. Patricia Patton, also known as the Canna Boomer, has worn a variety of different hats throughout her incredibly interesting life. She's a community connector, a wellness and aging expert, an author. She's on a cannabis patient advisory board and the South by Southwest Board of Advisors. And right now, her passion is working to bridge the gap between the baby boomer generation and today's legal cannabis industry. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Where where are you from? Where did you grow up? What's your story? I am from Seattle, Washington. I was born there and went to school there. I went to public school. I also went to the University of Washington where I have my degree from, but I also attended, because I have a degree in Romance Linguistics, I attended the University of Nice in conjunction with the University of Washington. How did you end up from from the West Coast over here on the East Coast? I was one of the first Black stewardesses for Pan American Airline. No way. In 1970, so I flew the first 747s out of JFK. What? And so I was hired in San Francisco, based in New York in January of January of 1970. Wow. Yeah, I'm ancient. That's an amazing story. <laughs> <laughs> you must have seen so much change just in like in the culture of America, let alone the culture of cannabis. Yeah, uh, actually, it's been my fascination, really, that, you know, change has really been the thing that's been the driver. And it's really been the thing that I've become some of somewhat of an expert in, yeah. because, you know, you have to pivot and you've seen, you know, basically um, analog to really digital. Yeah, so. I, I was kind of thinking about this the other day in regards to music, how far we've come with music, because I'm still not very good at figuring out how to download and make like playlists on Spotify and like simple things like that. I grew up with cassette players <laughs> in the 80s, and I keep telling myself that like I've always given my parents a lot of crap for not being very good at, at changing with technology. And now here I am just feeling like, actually, it's not that easy to change, you know, like once you get kind of comfortable with a way of living. I'm not always somebody who really likes to make big changes like that. My parents who are now in their 70s, they've actually become better at it because they've lived through more change than I have. So I think they've learned to be sort of adaptive people, you know. Yeah. And I think one of the things that happens as you age is you, and some people never get it, but is that you come to understand that there's no growth if you can't go into the unknown part of it. I mean, most people want to stay where it's comfortable because, you know, if you've suffered at all, you don't want to chance suffering. Mm -hmm. And if you make a move, like there's always a chance 
that you might have to suffer a little bit until you can make the adjustment. So people don't want to do stuff. Right. But, um, you know, I'm also a parent. So I was drugged through the hip hop era because my kid was born in 81. And uh, now I have grandchildren, so they're going to take me the rest of the way. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see all the changes. That's so cool. So what kind of changes have you noticed in the cannabis industry from, you know, when you first started having a relationship with the plant up until now? You know, I was exposed to the plant as a teenager, but I didn't really have a relationship with it because, you know, I had dreams and I wanted to live my dreams. I wasn't going to take any chance on something that I really didn't understand. Yeah. And so I continued to live my life. And my dream, of course, was to get out of Seattle and get to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So um, I made my way to New York via San Francisco because I dropped out of college after two years and went to San Francisco to live for a year. So I was in San Francisco living on the corner of Haight and, and Asbury in December of 68 as a dropout. What did that area look like at that time? I've heard so many stories and seen so many movies. What was your experience of San Francisco in the late 60s? It really was about love. Like, I mean, I actually believe that we were going to change the world. Yeah. You know, I mean, I really believe that we were going to change the world, that there was a possibility, you know, like all those things about uh, love, peace and happiness and not trusting anybody over 30. I mean, we really believe that young people would change the world just as young people today mm -hmm. feel that they would change the world. And they will, you know, they they will. But we thought we would, like, completely flip everything. When I got to San Francisco, it was about a year after the Summer of Love. So this was a time when you'd meet people at a bus station. Maybe you'd share a joint with them. Hmm. You know? That's trust. Yeah. I couldn't trust somebody now that offered me a joint on the street. Oh, I would never either. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but back then, that was, that was really the deal. But by the same token, I was a sort of schizoid about that because I really came from a community that was trapped by the social ideas around drugs, mm. you know, and and all the propaganda about who smoked and who did. And so I really was sort of in and out because I wanted my own dreams, my personal dreams to come true. I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to, you know, buy shoes at Bergdorf Goodman. And and did you see that like getting involved in weed was sort of stand in the way of that? Of course. Yeah. I mean, who wants to go to jail? Right, right. I mean, here's the deal. I had a lot to lose. You know, I was a woman. I am a black woman. And I really wasn't willing to to risk my future. Mm -hmm. So I basically am one of these people who was on the down low, you know. And really, most of the people I knew were on the down low. I mean, we weren't selling drugs and making noise. You know, we were we were trying to be first generation lawyers and we were trying to assimilate, mm -hmm. have a good life. You know, because the Civil Rights Act was in 1964, which was giving folks both the right to vote and also trying to force corporations to hire people. Right. So, you know, by 1980, I had gone back to New York. By 1980, I was writing for the National Council of Negro Women's Women's Center, and I was writing stories about 25 years after the Civil Rights Act. And all those stories were Harvard case studies about people who were first, like the first black buyer at Bloomingdale's, like the first paralegal at a Wall Street law firm. Mm. So this is 1981 mm. when I was writing these things for the Women's Center. So it, it's like things changed and they stayed the same. Yeah. 
So you saw a lot of social movement on the ground, but then there was also sort of, I guess, bigger political structures at work that have really kept people's relationship with marijuana, I think, in place, especially regarding stigma. Because what you're saying about how people are, you know, even back in the 60s, were very afraid to engage with the plant for legal reasons. I think that that's still the case now. I know a lot of veterans who don't want to start applying for a medical marijuana card because they're afraid of the rights they'll get taken away at the VA. There's a lot of immigrants I know who don't want to get involved in the plant still because there's still this legal framework that, that kind of keeps us separated almost from this plant that can really be about health and wellness. And I think it's just really interesting how so much has changed culturally, but still we have this huge stigma over the plant and it's almost like it's holding all of us back from really accessing the wellness that we could get from it. I agree with you because if I was 55, I'm not so sure I would be talking as loud as I do now. Hmm. You know, I don't, I don't have a nine to five job, but if I had a nine to five job or if I was really concerned about people hiring me and using that against me, I don't know that I would be as willing to talk publicly about my journey or how I feel, what I believe, even at this point with legalization in what? 33 states and, you know, 14 or what have you, recreational. I mean, basically, I'm just not so sure that I would do that. And, and that's because I'm a product of a framework where notwithstanding everything that people say about we're, we're free to do this or the fact that it's legal, in states, we still have the problem that it's not legal federally. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing is that the police system cannot be trusted mm -hmm. to be fair to everyone. For sure. There's a lot standing in the way of, of the change of the stigma and the, I think the change in, in the way that people in America see people who consume cannabis. There's a huge stigma that's put on cannabis consumers. I think that's been long running. But I want to talk about specifically the age group that you connect with. Boomers are the fastest growing demographic that are starting to embrace medical marijuana. But there seems to be sort of a disconnect between people who want to now get involved with using the plant for health and wellness and where they can learn about this huge swath of information that we're getting nowadays about the science, about the different products. Where do you think we can work on that disconnect to try and connect, you know, people who, who want to try the products with product manufacturers? When I first tried to stick my flag in the ground around the idea of a can of boomer, I really wanted to address this segment of the market. I'm three years in and trying to educate myself with all the things that have changed. And over the course of that three years, I would say that a good part of that time has been spent me trying to find a place for myself, mm -hmm. you know, because within the, the community of people who are knowledgeable about cannabis, people who are enthusiasts as opposed to can of curious there is like a segmentation yeah. you know yeah. most of the people that you hear talking are people who have more experience with the plant themselves from personal use and so i have not quickly found a place or interest from brands trying to reach this segment of the market. I, I, I personally don't feel that brands are doing their best work. Yeah. You know, uh, because the World Health Organization even talks about the global population uh, of people age 60 plus doubling from 11% to 22%, 11% in 2000 to 22% in 2050. 
So what's happening is you have point of service information coming. 